Hello and welcome back. In this video, we will see how we can measure inflation using the Consumer Price Index or the CPI and the GDP deflator. As we said previously, one concern of macroeconomics is price stability. So it's important for us to know how we can measure this price stability by measuring inflation. The most well-known indicator of inflation is Consumer Price Index, CPI, which measures the percentage change in the price of a basket of goods and services consumed by households. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, CPI, it's a price index computed each month using a bundle that is meant to represent the market basket purchased monthly by the typical urban consumer. The CPI market basket shows how a typical consumer divides his or her money among various goods and services. Most of consumers' money goes toward housing, transportation, and food and beverage. As you can see in the graph in front of you, housing represents the major component where people, they spend their money, followed by transportation and food and beverage. Now, in order to calculate inflation, the formula for calculating the inflation rate looks like this. CPI final minus CPI initial divided by CPI initial times 100. So here, if we want to calculate the inflation rate between year 950 and 951, what we can do, we can figure out which one is CPI final. So it's 26. CPI initial, it's 24.1. So it's 26 minus 24.1 divided by 24.1 times 100. So the inflation rate is 7.9%. The method of calculating inflation is the same, no matter what period we desire. For instance, if we want to see and to calculate the inflation rate between year 1964 and 2003. If you want to calculate it by your own, please pause the video and later check for the answer. So now, in order to calculate it, also we do 184 minus 31 divided by 31 times 100. So it's 493.55%. So almost the prices increased by five times. Negative inflation, like in year 2009, is called deflation. And here we're having a price decrease. We have to differentiate it from what we call it disinflation, which means that prices are not rising as fast as they once were. So falling inflation does not mean falling prices. And we can see here between year 1997 and 1998, the inflation rate it decreased from 2.3 to 1.6. And here, it doesn't mean that the prices are decreasing. However, the prices are increasing, however, in a decreasing way. Another way to calculate inflation is the producer price index. These indexes measure, they are measures of prices that producers receive for products at all stages in the production process. Many other countries use a similar variant called the wholesale price index, which measures and tracks the changes in the price of goods in the stages before the retail level. So the indexes are calculated separately for various stages in the production process. 
The three main categories are crude materials, intermediate materials, and finished goods. Another way of calculating inflation is by using what we call the GDP deflator. So the GDP deflator is an index number that compares the nominal GDP to real GDP for a given year. Now the nominal GDP of a given year is computed using that year's prices, while real GDP of that year is computed using the base year's prices. So nominal GDP is not adjusted for inflation, while real GDP is adjusted for inflation and reflects the real amount of goods and services produced within an economy. Unlike the consumer price index, the GDP deflator is not based on a fixed basket of goods and services, since it includes all domestically produced goods and services. So changes in consumer preference and the arrival of new goods and services are also reflected in the GDP deflator. So the formula to calculate the GDP deflator, it's nominal GDP divided by real GDP. If we want to calculate the GDP deflator, for example, for year, for year 2020, and we know that the base year, it's 2015. So we're having an example here where the real GDP for year 2020, it's $100,000 and the nominal GDP, it's $108,000. So the GDP deflator, it's 108%. This result means that the aggregate level of prices increased by 8% from the this year 2015 to the current year 2020. Now, after measuring inflation by the different methods, we have to see what are the costs of inflation. In fact, there are many costs associated with inflation. First, reduced international competitiveness. If a country has a relatively higher inflation rate than its trading partners, then its exports will become less competitive, leading to a fall in exports and deterioration in the country current account. The second cost of inflation is confusion and uncertainty. In fact, when inflation is high, people are more uncertain about what to spend. The same happens for firms who are usually less willing to invest because they are uncertain about future prices, costs, and profit. This will lead to a lower economic growth. Third cost that we're having, it's boom and bust economic cycles. High inflationary growth, unsustainable, and is usually followed by recession. By keeping inflation low, it enables a long period of sustainable economic growth. And this is why most of the countries, they target an inflation rate of 2% as an objective for them. Another cost, it's the menu cost. This is the cost of changing prices lists. When inflation is high, prices needs frequently changing, which incurs a cost. Also, another cost that we're having for inflation, it's shoe, shoe leather cost. It's re, it refers to the cost of time and effort that people spend trying to counteract the effects of inflation, such as holding less cash and having to make additional trips to the bank. In fact, we hold less cash because we want to keep them in the bank in order to earn the interest. So this is why we make 
several trips. Also, one cost that we're having for inflation, it's the cost of reducing inflation itself. Since high inflation is deemed unacceptable, therefore governments, central banks, feel it's best to reduce it. This will involve higher interest rates to reduce spending and investment. This reduction will lead to a decline in economic growth. Finally, another cost that we're having for inflation, it's income redistribution. Inflation will typically make borrowers better off and lenders worse off, since it reduces the value of savings, especially if the savings are in form of cash or bank account with low interest rate. In order to better understand the income redistribution, we have to understand the difference between real and nominal interest rates. In fact, real interest rate is an interest rate that has been adjusted to remove the effects of inflation. It reflects the real cost of funds to the borrower and the real yield or profit to the lender. Meanwhile, nominal interest rate refers to the stated or advertised rate on a loan. So the nominal interest rate, it's the real interest rate plus inflation. Now, in order to better understand how the income redistribution happens, consider someone who borrowed $100 at a rate of 8%. So at the end of the year, he will get uh, back with $108. 3% will be for the inflation and 5% or $5 will be as a profit for the lender. However, if the inflation was higher than expected, let's say instead of 3%, it was 4%. So here, with the same nominal interest rate, the real interest rate will be 4%. It means the lender will earn less. So instead of $5, the lender will earn $4. And this is why we say in period of high inflation, the borrower is better off and the lender is worse off. Finally, economists have debated the, serious, the seriousness of the cost of inflation for decades. No matter what's the real economic cost of inflation, people don't like it. Thank you for watching this video. If you like it, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're having any question, please leave it in the comments below.